and welcome to Social PR Secrets. My name is Lisa Beyer and I'll be your host. Today's guest, I welcome Jean Jennings. I had the best time talking with Jean and learning all about the ins and outs of email marketing. Email marketing is a struggle if you're a PR professional. That's my opinion. I think email marketing is a struggle for all brands because it seems like every year somebody is saying email is dead and every year somebody is saying email, this is the year for email. It's never been stronger and better. Well, welcome, Jean. She is going to break down all of the most important things that we need to know about email marketing and more. I love hearing all of Jean's secrets. I learned so much in this episode, and I can't wait to have her on again. Welcome, Jean. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Social PR Secrets. I am here today with Jean Jennings. How are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you, Lisa? Good, good. I'm excited to chat with you today because email marketing is our topic. And I would say email marketing is from a digital PR standpoint is a weak link. It's something that I think we all need to focus and learn more. And it's kind of been like more in the house of digital marketing, but I feel like every brand needs to be well-versed on email. And I feel like you're the perfect subject matter expert to have with us today. Thank you. I love to talk email. I've been focused on email for uh, about 20 years now. So it's definitely near and dear to my heart. I feel like every year, every couple of years we go through this, is email dead phase? Like just (laughs) is SEO dead? Is PR dead? Is the press release dead? But I feel like email has made, I don't want to say a comeback. It's just never, it's never been more important than it is today. Do you agree? I totally agree. You know, it's funny because they've announced that email is dead many, many times and it never, ever comes true. It's been the leading channel in terms of return on investment for years now. Um, The most recent data on that was published, I believe it's last year by the DMA UK. And they found that you generate, I think it's 35 or 36 pounds for every pound that you spend on email marketing, because obviously UK currency. So it's, it's kind of one of those, it's kind of the workhorse of the digital marketing world. It works, even if you do it not so well, it's usually very profitable because it's inexpensive. And then if you put some resources behind it, it can be incredibly, incredibly uh, profitable and it's just always there. So yeah, I think it kind of doesn't get the attention or the love that it deserves. Most digital marketing programs, email is really at the heart of it, generating the email, spinning off the pro- generating the revenue, spinning off the profit for the other channels. Yeah. And I mean, if you really think about it in its most basic form, I just put together a module last week and I included an email marketing part of it for my PR class that I'm putting together. And I mean, email is basically the most universal way to communicate, you know, every country, every continent, you know, everybody has email. Like that's the way, even if you don't speak the same language, you can send an email to somebody, you know, and they can translate it. Yeah. There's a funny cartoon from years ago and the guy's on his phone and he's like, I'm on this great new social platform. I can send images. I can send copy. I can reach out to anyone in the world. Nobody has to sign up. You don't have to pay for it. It's, and the guy goes, Oh my God, this sounds awesome. What is it? And he's like, email. (laughs) So a lot of people consider it kind of the original social media platform. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So tell me about what are some of the, you know, whether you're a small brand or a large brand, what are some definite trends that you want to share with us and some, like maybe some trends and some do's and don'ts that you see happening? Sure. You know, at a high level, I think one of the trends that I'm seeing, and and we've been seeing it for a few years, but it's now it's one of those things that's really going to start to separate the successful programs from the less successful programs is automation. So the idea that email is great at triggering messages based on the behaviors or actions of the people on your list. And that's one thing that I'm seeing with a lot of my clients now. We're looking to automate email programs because once you automate it, it's not necessarily set it and forget it. You still want to do testing. You still need to make sure everything's working, but it's a one-time, you you do the work one time and then it just continues to run and spin off revenue for you for months or years. Um, Some natural things to automate is a browse reminder email. So when you have someone come to your site, let's say for instance, you're a retailer, they look at a few products they don't buy, but to reach out to them with one to three efforts to say, hey, you know, come back, you looked at these. That's something that can be very successful at bringing people back to the site and driving revenue. And then obviously related to that are cart abandonment emails, which are just huge and have been for years. When people leave something in their cart, you reach out to them via email. 
we see um, tremendous, tremendous ROI on card abandonment emails. And again, they're not that hard to do. You set it up once and then it runs. So automation is definitely a trend that people need to be looking at. I love that. And I've noticed also when I, I visit websites, not so much e-com websites, but even if I visited um, a blog or an online publication, I'll start getting the emails that are basically just content, you know, weekly content emails that might be an excerpt from three of their most recent articles. So I think that from, you know, maybe a PR or just content marketing standpoint, the automation Oh, yeah. example is I think something that I, I don't think a lot of brands are really have that top of mind if you're not e-com. It's huge. And, you know, typically what we do there is an email newsletter because the content is editorial rather than promotional, which can actually be very effective. If you think about your own browsing habits, you may read something that you like on a blog, but next week, you're probably not going to independently think to go back there and see what their newest item is. So email can be a way to communicate with people. We do see a lot of success with email newsletters, driving people back to your content. If they keep your, your brand top of mind. I really have said for years now, I think really every business should have an email newsletter program, whether it's once a month or once a week. You need to get out there and talk to people. And the real key to success with all of this is getting that opt-in at the front. Having people proactively raise their hand to have an email relationship with you, because that's really key to success. You don't want to be emailing people who don't know you from Adam. That's not going to work very well. Okay. So I want to talk more about the editorial newsletter, but mm -hmm. the opt-in thing, what are some tips to get somebody to opt-in and, and grow your list? And then let's talk a little bit more about the editorial newsletter because from a from a PR standpoint, you know, that's that is critical. And I think that it's really just gets forgotten that that's that's a strategy. Yeah, no, totally. And it's funny because I worked with a client earlier, I guess it wasn't this year, I guess it was last year, and they were a PR agency and I worked with them on their email newsletter and we had a lot of success. But the opt-in is really important. And really for most companies, your website is going to be ground zero for your opt-in campaign. So you want to have a couple things. One is you want to have a sound value proposition. So, you know, if you just say, hey, we have email, nobody really needs another email, right? I don't. You probably don't. Yeah. <laughs> but if you say we have information that's going to help you do your job better, enjoy your hobby more, keep you up to date, you know, help your career, that's the kind of stuff that people are happy to receive. And so you want to make sure you've got that value proposition on the upfront. What are they going to get by signing up for this newsletter? The second key is really having that call to action above the fold on your website. There's been a trend in the last, I don't know, five or six years when web designers come in. It's fascinating to me. They say to, they say to people, so the email opt-in belongs in the footer. And what we've seen consistently is when you take that opt-in below the fold, you see a decrease in the percent of visitors that I'm sure. Yeah. Um, I did a case study years ago and just by moving the call to action above the fold, it was slightly below. We increased their signups by 30%, which is huge for most companies. Yeah. So we just launched our website and I, I'm going to have to check out and see where it's located. The, the opt-in probably it's below the fold, if not in the footer. So we're making mistake number one, but I'm going to fix it as soon as we're, we finish with this interview. But so what would you suggest if it's not in the footer, is it actually like part of the top of the fold? Like part of the design is, is going to be the, the opt-in value proposition. Exactly. A very traditional place for it is if you have a website that has a right rail or a right column, you mm -hmm. put it at the top of the right column. You can also put it at the very top of, of the email, maybe next to your logo. Um, and it should appear on every page. That's another mistake a lot of companies make. With deep linking, you never really know where people are gonna enter your site. So whether they enter on a blog page or on a product page or on the home page, you wanna make sure that that email call to action is right there because if they're interested enough to spend any time on your site, they're probably a great candidate to be an email newsletter subscriber for you. What do you think about the pop-ups? When they <laughs> personally or professionally or both well both <laughs> yeah yeah I mean do they work sometimes they're, I mean they're very annoying to me if it's an e-com site you know give us your email for 10 percent off but I mean do they work so from a personal standpoint I find them incredibly annoying um, especially annoying to me are the ones that pop up before you've seen anything on the site and offer you a discount on products you're not aware of anymore in return to your email address because I don't really know if I want to buy anything there. And if I don't want to buy anything there, getting a 10% off discount doesn't help me. So personally, I'm not a fan of those. Professionally, 
Yeah, they work really, really well. What I usually try to do with my clients is rather than have them pop up immediately, which does probably get you more names on the list, we hold it and we have it pop up later in the visit. So maybe on the second or third page they visit, maybe after X number of seconds, because we want to give you time to spend some time getting to know us before we go for that commitment, right? It's yeah, like I that, like that. It's like that person who comes up to you and is like, hey, you want to get married? And you're like, whoa, man, like what about <laughs> coffee first, <laughs> right? So let them get to know you. And yeah, and you know, it's hard because I've worked with so many clients over the years who are like, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. And then, you know, after six or eight months, I'm like, you know, the only thing on the list that we haven't tried are pop-ups and they go, okay. And we try it. And not that we haven't gotten incremental improvements with the other changes we've made, but that one tends to really, really boost response. Yeah. I think if you're in marketing, you hate pop-ups, <laughs> but if you're not in marketing and, you know, it's just part of like, you think it's part of life or whatever. So let's talk about more about the editorial newsletter and maybe walk us through some strategies that are modern strategies that work today, visually, copywriting, frequency. Yeah, so let's start with frequency. Going less than once a month, you're really not doing yourself any favors. You wanna be there enough that you're top of mind. So I always say at least once a month, you also want to let your content kind of drive your newsletter. I have a client now, they do this amazing newsletter, but it's gotten so long that most of the stories at the bottom of the newsletter get no love, no attention, no clicks. Mm -hmm. So one thing I've been talking to them about is, you know, now that we have enough content, because we've been out there probably about a year with it, let's split it into two. Let's go twice a month. And that way, overall, more of that content will get seen and clicked on and get love from the subscribers. So Definitely at least once a month. Once you have enough content, think about going twice a month. The content angle is really important. The biggest mistake I see, especially for business to business newsletters, is a newsletter that's all about us. I get these all the time. Hey, we hired a new VP of sales. Mm -hmm. Hey, we won this award. Hey, this is our employee of the month. Hey, we signed 10 new clients. There's not a lot of value in that for a reader. Better to say things like, hey, here's a case study about how our client improved their ROI with our product, with tips so that you can do this, whether or not you have our product. Hey, here's an article that will help you do your job better. Nope, doesn't promote our product at all, but we're going to help you do your job better. And by the way, another way to do your job better is to use our product. So really kind of changing that focus. Stay away from the me, 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 I, I, I mentality. Exactly. You know, the other thing we did with my other client, it was interesting because I've seen this a couple times now in the B2B world. People who are doing sections of their newsletter, which is not a problem, but creating the sections based on the type of content it is. So here's some videos, here's some blog posts, here's some third party articles. The thing is that for most people, they don't necessarily care about the, the medium, what they care about is the message. So with the client I worked with late last year, the PR firm, we actually rejiggered their email newsletter. They had a couple core areas that they focused on. So we rejiggered the newsletter to be focused on those sections. So the idea is that if you're really concerned about renewable energy, this section of the newsletter has a video and a third-party article and two blog posts about renewable energy. This section is about a different topic. So the idea of trying to get outside of the box of the medium and really think about what people are interested in. And it seems like it's almost treating it like a magazine concept where somebody can kind of flip through, flip through maybe quickly visually and jump to wherever they most interested in. Exactly. Because especially if you have different target audiences, you know, the people who are interested in renewable energy, they're not going to be so much interested in the fossil fuels section of your newsletter. And that's fine. That's not a problem. But yeah, exactly. What about visually? What are some tips from the visual? I, I, I get emails. Sometimes it's just all text. You know, like the just kind of spaced out, very airy, easy to read, but no visuals. And then there's the opposite where it's more of, you know, visual impact and less text. Yeah. So you really need to think about what's right for your audience and what's right for your product. If you're selling, if you're a retailer and you're selling clothes, you're going to have to show me that dress. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to buy that dress based on a description. For most B2B companies though, and I think most PR firms fall into this, the message is really in the copy. So the visual should be there to support the copy 
and to pull people in and engage with the copy. So pictures of people tend to work very well. If you're interviewing an expert or if you're doing something like that, people always like to see pictures of people. Stock photography tends not to be the best plan. And especially, again, thinking about that ratio, if you're business to business and the message is in the copy, then your email needs to have more copy and less images in it, fewer images in it. So yeah, really thinking about that. The other thing that you have to think about with images is in email, we have image blocking. Most desktop clients block images by default, which means they don't show up. So the other big issue I see, and we've tested this many times with many clients, the newsletter, when you open it up, it looks like a web page. It's got a big hero image at the top, which is great unless images are blocked by default, in which case you've got a big white space at the top and nothing to engage people. Right. So you want to make sure that image is, is not the only thing in the preview pane. You want to make sure that there's some rich text copy in there that people can read because that's really what's going to pull people in. That makes sense. So speaking of copywriting, the subject line is so important. And th- there's this trend that's been happening for a few years now that some like these all lowercase, no capitalization. <laughs> and the, is there like, what's the theory behind that? Is there, what, what's the sci-fi behind that? Yeah, it's funny because if you look at it, it's not just subject lines. It's also happening in like blog post titles and article titles. Yes. Um, A lot of people have changed their style. So um, in the, I don't know, when I was in school, the rule for a headline was all of the keywords are, are capitalized. Things like and and it and, you know, as or not. But that's really changed. And the thinking is, I think the thinking is that it's more readable if it's not all caps. And I don't. I don't really have an opinion on that. I haven't read any studies. So yeah, that's not, here's the thing about that. That's not something that tends to impact performance. Whether the, the, you know, whether everything is lowercase or only the first word is uppercase or all the words are uppercase, that doesn't necessarily be something that that affects performance. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. Obviously you don't want to go all uppercase because you know what that means online, right? Yeah. That's like yelling. (laughs) So I wonder if like all lowercase is just like softly, but yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, but I mean, subject line is so important. What are some tips to really help impact that open rate? Yeah. So subject lines are an art and a science. So let me talk a little bit about the science of it. With truncation, both on desktop clients and on your mobile phone, you can only really guarantee that someone's going to see the first 25 characters of your subject line. So you want to make sure if that's all they see, that there's enough there to get you the open. I've done a lot of testing over the years with subject lines. It was a couple of Christmases ago, I had a client and they had a 12 days of Christmas sale and their subject line started was six day of Christmas sale, colon, here's the product. Fifth day of Christmas sale, colon, here's the product. Cause every day was a different product. Was yeah. Coming. So just by flipping that to put the product first, because that's really what people care about, right? They don't care that it's the fifth day or the sixth day of your sale. We got a tremendous boost, not only in open rate, but in revenue generated. Because the people who were coming in, even in some cases, the open rate was the same as the the control version, but the people who came in were more highly qualified because they knew that they were interested in baseball caps or t-shirts or whatever was on sale. That makes sense. That's very important. The first 25 characters. The other thing to think about is there are all these myths out there about the subject line that we really need to dispel. So one of my favorites is you can't use free in a subject line because you'll go right to the spam folder. I actually think this is, well, I shouldn't say that. I often wonder who starts rumors like these. And I often wonder if it's not the people using free in the subject line, because when we use free in a subject line, we actually see an increase in revenue and increase in opens and increase in engagements. So it's actually a tactic that works really well. So companies that are saying to themselves, well, I read that you can't do that. It's not true. Yeah. And you're actually holding yourself back. Right. There's no like evidence. And it's like, I heard, or somebody told me, or, you know, okay, <laughs> let's there, verify there, this. There, there was a viewer a few months ago on Twitter, which was, you can't use COVID in the subject line anymore because it'll go right to the spam folder. So I'm actually um, involved in, I've been a member forever. And now I'm managing a community of email marketing professionals called Only Influencers, which is open to everyone. But we have most of the top email marketing experts in the community. It's about 400 people. We're open to anyone. So when I saw that on Twitter, I immediately went to the OI community and said, hey, what's the deal? Like deliverability people, is COVID now, you know, can you really not use that in a subject line? Will it really send you to the spam folder? 
And unanimously, it came back. All of the experts in the industry were like, nope, nope, it's not true. We just checked. It's not true. And other people were like, hey, I actually I have an email program and we've been using COVID. And yeah, we don't see any problems with deliverability. So you really have to be careful. Sometimes information gets put out there that's just not right. Definitely. And so what about, we talked about the science side. What about the art side of the subject line? Uh, the art side. Emojis, is that part of it? <laughs> <laughs> Emojis are really interesting. Emojis used correctly can definitely boost your open rate. I think the key is like anything else though, right? You don't want to overuse them and you want to use them in a way that's relevant to your content, but not necessarily so universal that it's just going to not matter. So for instance, we just had Valentine's day last month. Everybody put hearts in their subject lines for Valentine's day. Yes. <laughs> that kind of canceled out any positive effect you're going to get. It was expected. The inbox, it made all of the emails in the inbox look pretty much the same. So things like that, you know, not so much. If you can think of other ways to do it, though, you can have a lot of success. So for instance, years ago, I worked with a company that did Lasix surgery for eyes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we tested using the smiley face with the sunglasses on. And that was kind of valuable. And the tie in there was, you know, you'll lose your glasses, laser surgery. So yeah. things like that can work very well. But again, you don't necessarily want to use them every time. And that's kind of the art of it. You want to get something that's really kind of smart and smart ways to use emojis that tie in with your product or that tie in with your message. I like that. What about, are there any tools that you like to use, like to test subject lines? I know there's a couple out there. Are there any, any that you use that you like? So actually the nice part about AB split testing is most email marketing platforms have that actually built into their platform. Oh, okay. You don't really need to go outside of the platform to test really anything anymore. Subject lines, body copy offers. Some have actually very fancy testing capabilities that allow you to use dynamic content to do multivariate. So you can test like three or more items and different mixes and matches. Maybe it's a headline and, a, and an image in the email and a call to action. Others just allow you to do simple A-B split testing, which actually works really well too. But yeah, you don't actually need to leave, you know, your MailChimp or your Oracle Marketing Cloud or your Bronto, which is actually going away in May 2020, 2022. You don't actually need to leave them. And I would actually recommend that you use the testing that is actually in your system because that's probably how you're going to get the best results, especially if you tie it back to your Google Analytics, where you can get information on conversions and revenue which are really your business KPIs that you're looking for. And it could be just simply driving people to your website. I've had clients where our goal is to get them to the website and get them to read, to, to, to visit two or three pages. So that's really important. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a big one too, is to make sure that Google analytics is hooked up because I have a lot of clients that, that do have it hooked up and then you can really see and track the, the revenue, especially if it's a, you know, direct to consumer e-com type, or just to see, you know, what traffic, the quality of traffic and how long they stayed, you know, maybe reading content or, or blogs or articles or company news. Exactly. And I just I actually just launched a promotion for a university that's a client of mine. We're doing a webinar, a free webinar to get people to engage. And in addition to email, we're doing LinkedIn ads and, and uh, search marketing ads. And, uh, and yeah, it's really critical. We actually have it tied into the thank you page for the webinar registration, because that's really what we're looking for. We don't want them to, that's all we need. We need them to sign up for the webinar. So yeah, we've actually tied that in so that it'll automatically tell us how many people have signed up from each of those different channels. And even with email marketing, we have a series of five emails that'll go out. We'll be able to track it by individual email, which will be really helpful going forward. And being in the PR industry, so you know, we're doing press releases or you know, doing outreach, maybe surrounded on the news would be an event. And, you know, I'd like to help, you know, add value and think, okay, we're not just we're not just getting the word out. We're also helping maybe build your, your email list. So maybe do you have any tips on hosting an event for the purpose of building your email list? Like what are some do's and don'ts when it comes to that? Yeah. So one important do is, um, first of all, it's a really good idea to do that. That's, that's a value proposition right there. You give us your email address. We will give you 45 minutes or an hour worth of content that will be useful to you. So that's a great thing to do. It's really important for legal reasons to on that registration page, give them the option to get on your email list or not. So it's, it's interesting in the United States, we have a law called can spam that was passed, put into effect in 2003. Mm -hmm. 
It does not require an opt-in, which was very disappointing to many of us in the industry. But CCPA out in California has a lot of requirements about giving people notice that you're getting their, collecting their personal information and GDPR over in the EU has very stringent requirements. So you want to make sure that you give people the option to get on your email list or not. I've actually have- So can you be more specific on that? So if somebody is signing up for, let's just say a webinar using their email address, they need to like also check a box that says, I agree to let you use this email for other marketing purposes. Is that what you mean? Yeah. And obviously you want to, you want to position it. You want to say, Hey, in addition to, you know, we do other webinars, we have a newsletter, we keep people updated on the industry. You know, would you, would you like to receive these communications as well? And by the way, you can unsubscribe at any time. So that kind of a message we've found that rather than just having a box. So first of all, GDPR does not allow a pre-checked box. Okay. You can't have it pre-checked where they have to uncheck to get off. Yeah. That, that's what I was going to ask is if you could say in order to not be on this, you need to check this, like. Okay. Yeah, that doesn't fly with GDPR. And even in the United States where it's technically legal, it's not a best practice and, and you potentially are adding risk, risk to your program. But what we found is rather than having a single checkbox for them to get on the list, it's actually much more effective to have a yes and a no box, like a radio button, mm -hmm. and require them to check one or the other. I like that. We find that doing that actually gets you more yeses than just an empty box where they have to check to get a yes, because it okay. makes them read what's there. And then when they read what's there and they think about it, if you've written it up in a benefit-oriented way, you're going to get more yeses. So if somebody signs up for your editorial newsletter, can you, is that kind of like free game where you can then, you know, if, let's just say you have four different newsletters that go out in different themes. It's not necessarily segmented, but they sign up for your email newsletter. Does that kind of open it up to your, they're saying, yes, you can use my email to communicate with me on whatever you're communicating about, or do you still need to have some sort of a. So in the U S you can get a blanket opt-in. Okay. And again, the U.S. when it comes to email is a little bit still kind of, it's not quite the wild, wild west, but there's not a lot of regulations around it. Now, that said, you want to be cautious and you want to respect your subscribers. First of all, it, it's not great. Initially, you might get that blanket opt-in and then sign them up for things you think that are of interest. You want to make sure that if they want to get off a list, there's a preference center they can click through to, and then hopefully they'll get off just the one they're not interested in and stay on some others. But again, you need to be really respectful of that email address because if someone signs up to get news on the you know, renewable energy industry and you start sending them that and fossil fuels and, and other things, they're soon going to get tired of your email. They may unsubscribe, which would not be good. They may report you as spam, which they would have the right to do, which could get you blacklisted, which is actually very bad. Mm -hmm. um, and they could just stop opening your emails and start ignoring you which doesn't do you any good either. Yeah. There was a famous case years ago. I'm, I'm a sports fan and I signed up at ESPN to get sports news, primarily on my hockey team, the Washington Capitals. And uh, back then I used to, we call it tagging. I used to tag whenever I signed up for something. So I, I signed up with ESPN at mydomain.com, which meant it would come to me, but I would know, I would know where I signed up, where I used that. Yeah. So all of a sudden I started getting these daily soap opera updates. And when I looked at it, it was coming from my ESP, it was coming to my ESPN at my domain account. And so I logged back into ESPN and I realized there was a pre-checked box about getting offers from their partner companies, including Disney and some others. That's so and annoying. It's annoying, right? And Disney, I probably would have been fine hearing about, although not a lot because I don't have children, but they also, I noticed they asked my gender when I signed up for ESPN, which if you think about it, there's really no reason that they need to know your gender. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, but I hypothesized that maybe the men who signed up didn't get the soap opera update. Not good. Yeah. Not good. So yeah. that's another thing you want to be respectful. And a lot of that stuff has, has, I think people are a lot better now than they were even like 10 years ago. Yeah. That's what you want to think about. Would they really be interested? The other thing you can do, and I've done this with clients many a time, let's say you've got one email newsletter product and you're launching a new one, or you have another one that they didn't sign up for, just put an offer for that in the newsletter you're sending them. Hey, if you like this newsletter, we have this other newsletter. You might like that as well. And so do it that way to get the opt-in. I like that. Well, I want to hear just a couple points and then we'll be kind of like running out of time, but what are some points that you notice when you're doing audits that are just 
you want to share with everybody that mistakes that brands are making when it comes to email marketing? Wow. I think a big mistake is, is brands that don't monitor their own deliverability, which is defined as getting to the inbox. And I think it's really difficult sometimes if you're new to it, you know, when you send an email campaign, you'll get back a number of bounces, which are emails that return bounces, alerting you to the fact that they weren't delivered. Mm. And then typically that non-bounce number is referred to as delivered, but that's very misleading. That doesn't mean that you got to the inbox. You may have gotten to the spam folder. It doesn't even mean that you got to the spam folder. All it really means is you didn't get a bounce. So that's the first thing that I would say. You want to make sure that you're monitoring your deliverability and making sure that you know you don't have a, an issue with with a block with a block listed IS IP address. So that would be the first thing. I think the second thing I see with audits are people who are so focused on the send that they don't take time to look at the results of their efforts. I typically, when I do an audit, I'll rank, you know, either their last month or their last year's worth of email messages from highest RPE revenue per email or whatever their, their goal is to lowest. And it amazes me. There are things that will just have a terrible return and yet they've sent them over and over and over again. And it might be that we need to change the creative on that that it's older, it never worked. It might be that the audience just isn't interested. So I think a lot of programs don't take the time to actually look at the results of the send. It's almost like they're just always focused on, I just have to get the send out, I have to get the send out, I have to get the send out. So that would probably be the second thing. And then the third is just companies that aren't really leveraging some of the newer tactics that are available in email marketing. And some of them are really simple things like personalization and customization, which is very easy to do. I think that we are finally coming into an era of email, I'm sorry, video and email, which is very exciting. Oh yeah. I, I wanted to chat about that. I'm yeah. glad you brought that up. Oh, it's very exciting. Yes. Um, in the past years ago, it was declared the year of video and email, and it was just too early. The problem with video is they tend to be very large file sizes. And so you can't actually embed a video until recently. You couldn't embed a video in an email because it would just be too big um, and it would be slow and jerky to play. And so what we've done with video for years now is put in a screenshot with a play carrot, and then they mm -hmm. click through and it plays on a website. And there's new patented technology out there now that a couple companies are using them, are using one of them is iMail, EY email, which interestingly enough is run by a woman, Lisa Jones, who's amazing. Oh, awesome. Yeah. And they have a patent and they have a patent on a compression, compression method they use that takes the video, compresses it down to be small enough that it's embedded. And she is doing a lot of exciting things and she has a lot of really big name clients and she's talking to some other big name companies. So I think video and email is gonna be bigger. Video has a couple of benefits. I mean, one is just the visual and everyone seems to like videos. YouTube usage is very high. The other thing that, that I'm finding in the world and I, I'd be curious to see if you're noticing it too. I think more and more people, including myself, we're getting away from reading content and we're, we're getting into listening to it and watching it. So for instance, you know, smart speakers, I've got a smart speaker in my house. I listen to a couple podcasts in the morning to catch up on the news much easier than what I used to do, which was actually reading and online. Yeah. So that's the other thing that video has, even if, even if someone's not so interested in the, the images, you know, the, the audio, the audio. Yeah, definitely. I think that's why clubhouse and Twitter spaces, you know, the audio side of things that, you know, even if there's video with it, it doesn't matter. Like just being able to listen to, you know, in your car, or like you said, with the the speakers, I love that idea. I'm, I love loom. Have you used loom to send emails? I have not used loom. Tell me yeah. about loom. So loom. So I use it. You can use it in traditional video ways, like for example, to record a course, but you can also, and it also has the Chrome extension. So you can just send emails like my friends that host Hustle and Flowchart, Matt and Wolf, Matt, Matt and Joe, they, they send thank you videos using Loom to all of their guests. And it's just such a nice touch. I'll forward you one of them. And it's just, it's awesome, but it, it's not an intrusive attachment. I think it's like you're saying, like it's embedded and it has a little emoji. So you can, you can see like, you know, send an emoji back and then you can tell if, how many people have actually viewed it. So if the person that you send it to, but I like it even for media, like pitching the media to send them a media pitch via video is oh. a lot more personalized than, you know, than sending just a, an, a regular text pitch, but just for thank yous or just, you know, just relationship building in general, video is just awesome. It's really, really great. It's really, really great. I think it's the future. Yeah. Well, tell us about your book, about your event and anything else you want our audience to know where we can follow you. 
Thank you. So my book was actually published back in 2007. And you can get some used on Amazon, but I believe it's out of print, although I think you can still buy the PDF. The Email Marketing Kit, The Ultimate Email Marketer's Bible. It was one of a series done by SitePoint, which is based in Australia. I didn't get, oh. to, I didn't get to, to do the title. They did that, but definitely check that out. But, you know, more interestingly and more up to date right now is I am honored to have been asked to take over as general manager of a group called Only Influencers, which was the original community of email industry professionals. We started about 12 years ago now by Bill McCloskey, who retired in December of 2019, and uh, I took over managing it. So it's, it's about 400 people. We're not huge. The name is a little misleading. It's only influencers, but really anyone in the email industry is welcome to join. And we have a, an email discussion list where we talk about things that are going on in email, like the example earlier about, you know, you can't use COVID in the subject line. We also do weekly discussions on Thursdays where we invite someone who's written uh, an, an industry article to come talk to us. It's small. It's usually about 20 or 30 people, but it's a one-on-one -on -one chance to talk to thought leaders in the industry and ask them about articles, ask them about anything really. And I then, love that. Yeah, we do a lot of things like that. So that's really cool. And then we also have an annual conference that we run, which is open to anyone called the Email Innovation Summit. Usually we're in Las Vegas, but last year and this year we are actually go, we're actually virtual. So it's June 17th. We're, we're accepting proposals to speak right now and registration will be open any day now. What we really do to set ourselves apart from some of the other conferences is we really do focus on innovations. So there's something called BIMI, which is now really big. I don't know if you've heard of BIMI for email. No, what is it? It's quite interesting. It's an authentic authentication technology, which will help you get to the inbox. But this one, unlike SPF and DMARC and DKIM and some of the ones that have come before it, has a secondary layer of branding in the inbox where it actually will show your logo next to your from line in the inbox. Oh, so nice. I love that. It's really, really cool. It's the first authentication technology. Authentication is really important, but a little bit boring and technical. So this is the first one that actually has this kind of sweetener for marketers. And we've actually been talking about BIMI at the summit since at least 2019, if not before that, when it wasn't available yet, it was in beta. We had a great session on AMP for email last year, and we'll be talking about AMP again. Again, it was, it was very, very early. AMP for email is interesting. It allows you to do a lot of transactional things like make a purchase right in an email, but there are security issues with it. So we actually had a point counterpoint with someone talking about the security issues and someone else talking about, yeah, but it lets you do all this great stuff. And then we asked the audience at the end to vote on how they felt about it. Was it worth it? What was the vote? <laughs> Are you allowed to say? <laughs> I'm allowed to say. So the answer was like, yes, we need AMP today. And no, the security concerns are too much. And then the other one was like, I don't know. There's just so much to think about now. And I think most people were like, I don't know. There's just so much to think about now. So but that's okay, right? Because we surfaced a lot of issues that weren't necessarily being discussed. So that's what we really try to do. It's really about strategies and tactics. You know, we have sessions that are done by email marketing practitioners and case studies, which is great. But in order to cover the innovative stuff, we also bring in experts in the field and talk to you about things that may not be available now, but will be available in the next six months or a year. Annotations is another big one. We have a, a great speaker lined up, Brian Sisolak from uh, Trilogy Interactive to talk about annotations, which is really new and upcoming. And it allows you to do even more with that inbox look. Okay. And just subject lines. So anyway. Are you, um, are you familiar with, I think it's called Superhuman. Is that the email platform? I'm not familiar with Superhuman. It's, it's, it's not on the marketing side. It's more on the inbox side. But yeah, I mean, it's funny. We're talking about all these email marketing tactics. And then I'm just like sitting here thinking, how do I get to inbox zero? You know, I hear people talking about inbox zero and- <laughs> If you're in the PR world or digital marketing world, or, you know, or you're a journalist, like there's just no yeah. such thing. There's no, just no such thing. I've never been an inbox zero girl. I, I haven't like, either. <laughs> I like to keep everything. I'm kind of the opposite. I'm kind of an email hoarder. Yeah. Because I, I want to, be able to go back and see things. Yeah. Yeah. That was part of my, the module for my PR class, just about in general, like journalists in webinars have said that their email hoarders, like they don't delete anything because they want to go back and search it and find the story source for a future interview or find whatever the email was. So they literally have like more than like this one journalist had like 2 million emails that, yeah. you know, so. Well, and, and you can because storage is so cheap now. Yeah. There's really yeah. no reason not to. 
Yes, yes. Well, Jean, this was awesome. I could like sit here and talk another hour about email marketing. I'm just thinking of all these different things. Like we didn't even really get to the customer journey part and how like you can send an email, you know, to somebody that's now a customer that's more of a prospect email. But maybe we can have you back and talk about that whole customer journey strategy of email that a lot of brands just disconnect on. I would love that. It's such a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks so much for inviting me today. Thank you. Thanks for coming and have a great, great day and happy International Women's Day. Happy International Women's Day. Thanks. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you for listening to this episode of Social PR Secrets. If you like what you heard, check out the book on Amazon or follow our blog at socialprsecrets.com. This episode was sponsored by The Buyer Group, a social PR agency striving to keep our balance in the digital world, practicing public relations, social media, and search marketing, while occasionally drinking a glass of wine or two for the best creativity and results. Thank you all for tuning in. If you would like to get a free chapter of Social PR Secrets, go to socialprsecrets.com slash free.